Hello, and welcome to HBO Succession, the analysis of a toxic family system, with Mandy Friedman, licensed professional clinical counsellor, and Andrew, her brother. Mandy Friedman here, licensed professional clinical counselor, clinically certified domestic violence counselor, clinically certified trauma professional level two, and the creator of SNAP Survivors of Narcissistic and Abusive Personalities. We're back talking about HBO Succession, season two, Greg. And I'm here with my brother, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. My name's Andrew. I am Mandy's brother, and I'm excited to talk about Greg the Egg, one of the most relatable characters in the show Succession. So Greg starts this season with an interesting situation. Logan has tasked him to kind of watch Kendall, but that turns into a flying monkey on a flying monkey. How does that all work? Logan is sending Greg, like you said, to look after Kendall because Kendall has just drowned a young man in a lake. He went to Norway for a couple of days. They sweep him right back in and they need him to get to work cleaning up their mess, but Logan doesn't trust him entirely, especially with the drug and alcohol problem. So he does send Greg to look after Kendall and Kendall immediately susses this out and is like, so, you know, you were sent to babysit me, I guess. And then Greg becomes a second, he's a double agent, essentially, <laughs> you know, he starts off as Logan's flying monkey and then Kendall turns him into another version of a flying monkey to go get him drugs, but also to be relaying information back and forth. So this has simultaneously made Greg's position all that more difficult, but also has really lifted him up in, in a way because now he's really in the know and he's being leaned on by more than one person. He gets to know the inner workings of multiple perspectives now. His status is rising as the show goes on. Um, and part of that is because he becomes, he gets put in these important positions. And one of the ways that Kendall makes him feel more important is by giving him a dope place to live. Yeah, he gives him a place to live. We know that Greg was looking for an apartment for a while. And, you know, you see him, like there's one where like the bed is up in this loft and he wouldn't even actually be able to sit up in the bed because he's so tall. He can't find a place to live and they're making fun of him in the different neighborhoods that he's going to look for places. You know, they're like joking, making jokes about it. And so finally he shows up at what he thinks is Kendall's new like penthouse. And it's actually Kendall saying, this is for you, Greg, you live here now. And Greg's like, ha ha ha. Yeah, right. I don't think so. And then he realizes it's real. And he's like runs around like a little kid. Like remember that movie big, but Yes, it turns out that is not exactly what's going on. It's not his. It's just in Kendall's name and Kendall's using it as a place to party. So when Greg comes home, there's tons of people there. And at one point there's people having sex in his bed and he's trying to tell Kendall, you know, hey, I wonder if there's a mistake because there are people in my bed right now and I'm really tired. I need to go to sleep. So he's sleep deprived. He's now a drug mule and a spy. There's always strings attached to every gift and every gift or, you know, uh, bump up in status from these people that we've been talking about. It, it's just another way for them to pull you closer so they can cut you, you know. And so that's what's going on with him. Now, another big storyline uh, from this season is a biographer that's looking into Logan and trying to investigate. And no one's supposed to talk to this biographer, but Greg he thinks he's making a move and he decides to have a meeting with him. He does. And one of the things he says, which is hilarious, is he's like, I'm not here. You know, like, I'm here at this meeting, but I'm not here at this meeting. And she's like, it's too late. You're already talking. We're already on the record. You're already here. He's like, no, no, I didn't get permission. I didn't get permission. So it's he just he doesn't really understand how things work. But it is true that he did meet with a biographer and then there's this huge witch hunt to find out who met with the biographer. She's already saying that she has an inside scoop from someone close to the family. Uh, so now Logan is on a hunt to find out who that person is. 
there's a lot of kind of um, shifting of blame and shifting of this. We've talked about it too in the first season where Tom thought he was going down for the cruise debacle and then it turned out it was another guy and now it's this and now it's this other thing. So there's always some crisis going on and someone's to blame. So Greg thinks that maybe he's to blame and he's got to hide that. Who will be the scapegoat is kind of the thing that ends up shifting around. Eventually, Greg ends up being safe because Mo is the scapegoat because he dies. Before Mo passes away, we're not sure who's going to take the blame for this. And, you know, you've got Greg who thinks he's got leverage because he was the one that did the shredding. Um, and then he kept some papers. And then we've got Tom, who actually was the person who ordered him to shred the papers. Um, and then you also have Connor, who's like, maybe I want to be the scapegoat. <laughs> who knows? You know, everybody's sort of like putting their hat in the ring to see what pans out. And Greg thinks that he's going to be potentially going down for this. Last time we talked about Tom's point of view during the shooting incident at uh, ATN. Uh, tell me a little bit about Greg's point of view and what he chooses to do during this whole situation. The shooting incident, as it turns out, was a self-inflicted gunshot. And it wasn't a shooter that was turning a gun onto, you know, peers at work. Um, but when this happens, you have Tom and he is talking to the person that we think is a Nazi that's a talking head for ATN. He's interviewing him. There's also a scene where Tom is putting his feet up on the human footstool and he invites Greg in to do that with him. This all happens kind of right around the same time that the shooting happens. So you have fresh in Greg's mind, the footstool thing. And then we hear bang, bang. And then Tom's pushing people out of the way and executive business get out of my way. They go in this room. That's a safe room. Not really a safe room. And Greg decides to take this opportunity to talk to Tom about having an open business relationship that he would like to work maybe not for Tom anymore, that they could still be friends and still you know, communicate, but he just would be working in a different department for someone else. Wouldn't be exclusive, you know, which is something that cuts Tom to the core because his wife just did this to him. Yes, from Tom's point of view, he was just betrayed by Shiv. Now Greg is betraying him and he gets really super upset. But from Greg's perspective, he's recognizing these very toxic things that are happening, not just the culture of the workplace, but also the landmines of potential things you could go to jail for. You know, he's realizing this is pretty messy and maybe being with Tom isn't my best bet. So he decides to toss it out there and Tom tosses a bunch of water bottles right at Greg and has a complete meltdown. And Greg is, you know, sort of cowering like, stop, stop, stop. And yeah, Tom's really upset. But like you said, you can see how Tom is triggered by this since his wife just dropped a bomb pretty similar on him not too long ago. Is there anything to say about Greg just refusing to defend himself physically? You know, because he refuses to defend himself physically. He does defend himself in another way we'll talk about. But is there anything to that? Anything interesting there? I think so. I think that he is trying to survive. And we have different survival or trauma responses in conflict or when we're feeling like our existence is threatened. There are some things that are hardwired in us that and each of us are different. You know, some people, you'll know them. They're the ones that fight. You know, when they are triggered, when they have a trauma response, it's, it's right to conflict and fight. And then others get really quiet and shut down and kind of slither away um, and get out of the way. So it depends on how you personally are wired as, as to how you're going to respond in these situations. And Greg seems to be what we would call a fawn, someone who fawns. So we have freeze, fight, flee, and fawn. Um, fawn is make friends with the enemy, make friends with the abuser, um, and, you know, make them happy, make them laugh, um, compliment them, and win them over. That's Get them what cocaine, fawn. you know. Yeah. Yeah, get them cocaine. Um, exactly. So he would be kind of like the people pleasing fawner that is not going to fight back. Instead, he's going to be passive, maybe do play possum, 
you know, I'm going to play dead. I'm no, I'm no threat to you. You know, I'm, I, I'm just passive Greg, no problem. I'm your buddy. And that seems to work for him. Actually. I don't think he should be maybe fighting and defending himself. I don't know if that would necessarily go well, or maybe it would because every time he seems to exert himself in that way, they like it and they give him positive feedback. So if he went off and decked one of them right in the nose, uh, maybe he would gain some respect. I don't know. This leads right to him gaining respect from Tom because he reveals to Tom that he still has these cruise documents that he did not uh, destroy to protect himself. And Tom loves it, right? Anytime that Greg reveals to Tom or Kendall that he's up to something or that he's got leverage, you know, whenever he reveals that, they crack a smile and they're just so pleased and proud of Greg for being that Machiavellian little fuck. And, you know, he he's learning how to navigate by using those kinds of tactics. And Tom is very pleased and then gives him a promotion after hearing it. He's like, good work, son. And now you, you know, now you're moving up in the world. Greg's like, okay, I guess that's a good, that's an attaboy then. He thought he was going to be heading into a fight, but that's not what happened. Every time he exerts himself, he gets a positive reinforcement. So he keeps trying these moves because they sort of work for him. When these narcissists that are around him, um, these sharks that are swimming around him and everything, when when he does surprise them with something like this, it's in a way they're proud of him, but they're also taking credit, right? Oh, you're okay. I must have taught you this. I see what's going on here. So sh shutting him down and saying it's bad, well, then they can't take credit for what's happening here. So that's a great point because Tom has put a lot into grooming Greg. You know, that's how you gain their favor is by letting them beat up on you. Essentially, if you take it and you don't squirm, you don't wriggle. That's what Tom will say to Logan. I can take it. I won't wriggle. You know, you Thanks can much. you can put it on me and I, I won't I won't try to to get out of it. You can go ahead. You know, like they respect that. And the more they beat up on Greg and the more he takes it, the more they're now more accepting of him and including him in things and seeing him as a actual part of the family. One thing we see from Greg throughout the entire show is that he practices self-affirmation and he likes to pump himself up. He does. You see him sort of like, like when he's uh, shredding the documents you see him like talking to himself and he's he's copying and then shredding and then copying and then shredding. You know, he's sort of like doing a dance. And uh, there's a scene where he's in the bathroom in the mirror and he's kind of, you know, talking to himself and getting himself pumped up. And you can just see him molding and shaping himself into what he needs to be, you know, sort of like like he's a human piece of clay and that, you know, all right, let's get it together. We can do this. He knows that this is his one shot to make it big. His mom sent him in and said, you need to get a job. You need to start being a part of that family because that's how you're going to be successful is to latch on there. And he really is giving it his best try. A big part of this season for Greg is his decision. Um, Ewan, his uncle, threatens to disown him because he's working for Logan. And this is like a fight between them. And, you know, he, uh, Greg is caught in the middle. And so um, he's threatening to disown him, take him out of the will. And Greg takes this to Logan. And he has to make a decision here on which old rich man he's going to serve. Which one will he be the flying monkey for? This is how abusive and toxic and narcissistic family systems work. You are with me or you are against me. It's also the same in the you know intimate partner relationships or one-on-one -on -one relationships, but it's more powerful in groups. And with Logan being the big man in charge and with Greg seeing how people get ostracized just like that, you can be Logan's own child and be at the bottom of the shit list, you know, like really get cast out. And Greg sees this happening to other people. He wants to avoid it at all costs. Because this is a narcissistic family system, there's no such thing as we all go our own ways and you free to be you and I'll be me. And no, Logan is saying to him, you got to choose. And he also says, don't worry, your grandfather is a coward. You know, he's not going to really cut you out of the will. He doesn't have that kind of, 
you know, he doesn't have the balls basically. He's to not do a serious like. person, right? Yeah, he's not a serious person. He's a pacifist, remember? So he's not going to have it in him to really cut you out. Don't worry about it. But he says to him, you got two choices. You got Uncle Fun or Grandpa Grumps. And it's really making you and look like a grumpy person if Logan is the fun one. <laughs> he's calling himself fun, fun Uncle and Grandpa Grumps because, man, Logan is awfully grumpy. But compared to you, and he is the fun one. That's true. So big decision for Greg. Uh, we'll see what happens as we go forward with him throughout the show. Um, Greg received 67 emails from Tom uh, that come up during the Senate hearing. Greg is going to have to testify. And one of the things that comes up during the testimonies of Tom and of Greg is that Tom sent him a shit ton of emails the night that the um, documents were shredded and the title of 67 emails was if you want to make a tomlet you're gonna have to break some Greg's <laughs> and this does come up in the Senate hearing and when Greg testifies it is so hilarious the word salad is worse than Tom's word salad word salad you know Tom had great word salad at the Senate hearing but Greg's word salad is far superior and quite hilarious. So I think it's important we include that in today's episode. You swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please take a seat. Senator Evis, it's your time. Gregory Hirsch, executive assistant to Tom Wamsgans, correct? Yes. <clears throat> yes, if, if it is to be said. I'm sorry? Uh, if it is to be said, so it be. So it is. Are, are you all right? Uh, yes, uh, I merely wish to answer in the affirmative fashion. You can speak to us normally. Okay. No, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so I shall. Well, Greg is always a great character to talk about. Like I said, I think he's the most relatable of the uh, characters on the show. He's kind of the audience surrogate when the show begins and leads us into this crazy world of billionaires. Um, Mandy, who are we going to talk about next time? The next episode is about the group dynamics and the sharks. We're going to talk about the people that work in the executive positions, but we're also going to talk about the family as a whole and how those two groups work together and separately. It's going to be a great episode because as the series continues, things get more complex. We know more now. We're piecing some things together. So the really the group dynamics are where you're seeing so much good stuff. I'm really excited to talk about that next time. That's right. And not only that, but we will also be talking about Boar on the Floor next time. You, you thought we forgot about Boar on the Floor, didn't you? <laughs> All of you are like, what about Boar on the Floor? I can't believe they haven't mentioned it yet. It's season two. How come it hasn't come up? Because we've been saving it for the, the group episode. It's the ultimate wildlife metaphor in succession as well. So thank you for watching or listening. Bye. This has been HBO's Succession, an analysis of a toxic family system.